What's up, Hugh? Hey, same old mate. How are you? It's all right. I think we only saw each other a couple of hours ago, didn't we? Yeah, I don't see that much of you at the moment. I know. Right? It's it's, it's terrible. terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> I know. It was like, as we come from lockdown now, and once again, this this is like you know, it's just feeling like. It's like, oh, this is the new norm. Like, I don't remember. It's like, you remember going to the shows? I don't remember those yeah. times. When was the last <laughs> show we were at? Three, three months ago, I think. When was the last show we were at, 1774? I don't think I went to a show after that. Yeah. I've, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. It was that show. That was, three, that was three months ago today. We haven't been to a show in three months. Yeah. And it's, it's just like at the moment, I feel like every day it's just like, all right, now we got some lockdown rules. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, I've only been locked down for eight weeks. <laughs> like, we do doing this show, we're not doing it. It's like, it's like, I don't know, it's like spending the, the four to spending summer in lockdown is fucking terrifying to me. I know, but <laughs> it's getting closer and closer, man. I was pretty cool at the start of lockdown. I was just cruising along, but I don't know. You go so far up and so far down. Like, some days the walls start closing in, man. But, then, like, oh. now the sun comes out, I'm feeling all right. But it's getting different, right? Like, I'm only allowed out of the house for 60 minutes a day now. Oh, yeah, that's right. You, you yeah. Like you're in the... Fun part. <laughs> it's not so good, but you know, oh, like, I go for like a million walks a day. I spend like three and a half hours a day probably just out walking the streets. <laughs> Getting those steps in, like three, yeah. uh, 30 steps or some shit like oh, that. Oh, I've been stepping. I've been stepping. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So, like, we have a guest on from there. Very special guest as well. Okay. Very special. Yeah. Hailing from Perth. He's been on such a great Australian promotions like Rebellion and uh, Muay Thai Grand Prix and internationally as well and won championship. Okay, we have on the, on the line here, Tyler Highcastle. How are you today, mate? What's going on, boys? How are we getting on? Yeah, going good. You know, good enough. Not too, not too bad. bad. Yeah. <laughs> as good as, as you can. <laughs> That's it. That's it. You got to do what you got to do, isn't it? <laughs> That's it. That's uh, it. That's it, man. Just got to pull those positive vibes from you. Put it on to me. That's it. That's it. <laughs> I'll do my best. All right. So, <laughs> hey, that's it. I don't expect any less. So, um, Tyler, so first time being on the podcast, mate. Really appreciate you coming on. Um, how about you give the folks a bit of background information on, like, you know, how did you start into Muay Thai or martial arts? And then we'll kind of progress into your, yeah, pretty stellar career so far. All right, so obviously I was born in England. Um, so the first time I actually started Muay Thai, I think I was maybe five years old. There used to be a gym near where I used to live called Wicker Camp in Sheffield. And my dad used to actually go and he used to do PTs there and stuff. And he started dragging me along. And that's kind of how I first got into it. Uh, I just used to go down and just punch the bags, and just mess about, you know, as a five-year-old. Like, I don't know, I can't even remember much about it, to be honest, but. That was like my first tasting into Muay Thai. Um, like I never used to spar or anything like that. I kind of just used to mess about with him there. Um, and then after that, I think I didn't. he wasn't doing that for very long. But after that, I progressed into going to a gym called uh, Mick Shaw's Academy of Martial Arts. Um, he kind of just did a bit of everything there. It was like the Filipino stick fighting stuff, all the nunchucks and BJJ and all that stuff. And um, I did that for a little while. I kind of got quite far into that as well, like did it for a while. And I was going to start competing in all that type of stuff, like BJJ and stuff. Um, but then obviously we moved to Australia. So I had to kind of leave all that behind. I think I was about 10 when we moved to Australia. And then um, I kind of didn't do anything for a while. I just used to play football. I didn't, it wasn't even in my head to even go back to it. And then my brother used to do, uh, what's that, that thing called? That BJC uh, Zendo Kai or whatever it's called. Oh, yeah. He used, to, he, uh, he used to do that. And there, there was a, a Muay Thai part of the gym. It was called Predator Muay Thai. And um, the, the, they had the Thai trainer, Jack 300, there. And um, so obviously, you probably all heard of Jack 300. He fought on yeah. Rebellion and all this type of stuff. And he was actually my first trainer in Australia. I had my first two fights with him. Um, so that that's when I, I think I was, what age was I, 14 or 15 when I got back into it with him. And um, 
that was class because that was like my first real taste of actual Thai style of training. Um, I had him pretty much training me every day, holding pads for me, teaching me how to clinch, spar, everything. So I used to just get bashed every day. And um, yeah, I had my first two fights with him. Uh, that, so I was 15 with my first fight. I ended up winning both of those. And um, so that was a pretty cool experience having that just because he, he was so raw. Um, there's nothing, there was only me and him. So it's kind of like a PT every day. So that was pretty cool. And then obviously after that, that's when, because he went back to, before he went to Khao Sok, he moved back to Thailand for a little while. And that was when I eventually went down to Riddler's. Um, I think that I found out about Riddler's because I went to an Epic when Epic's used to be on because Jack fought Clip Straight. Yeah. I remember that fight. That was a good fight. That was like the first Epic I went to. And that's when I first saw or heard about Riddler's. And um, yeah, when Jack decided, like, had to go back to Thailand, I'm not sure why, probably like a visa issue or something. But when he went that little break he had in Thailand, that's when I eventually moved to Riddler's. And then obviously I spent 10 years there. I got, I don't know, 36 fights or something out of there. So, so yeah, that was pretty much my kind of introduction into Muay Thai, really. Hmm. So I know it's like you were a bit younger, like you, <clears throat> UK to Australia. Did, did you have any comparisons? Do you remember anything like that? Like you know, like this kind of kind of scene there to to the Australian Perth scene. Uh, well, to be honest with you, I wasn't that much into it. Like I never w- went to watch fight shows when I was over there. Like I remember. A few times I was there because obviously in England a lot of kids fight like they start really really young. Yeah, and I remember a few times being there, and their kids classes being absolutely massive, and like watching them spar and I was like, yeah, nah, fuck that. <laughs> 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 I'll just stick with that. So, but yeah, I wasn't like into it, into it really when I was there. I didn't watch fight shows and I didn't really watch any fights or anything. It was kind of just following dad going down and and just messing around really. Mm. Yeah, fair enough. It's like you said, yeah. like. You know, that, that's kind of seen that it's it's a start so young like and there's so many ex- expats that have done so well in muay thai especially in europe yeah. as well yeah it's, it's like a hub for it really <laughs> yeah that's it hey. nah. <laughs> so um yeah and it was like great experience that you got as well like training with mm. jack 300 straight off the bat from that yeah. Uh, yeah. How, did, how did how did did your how did your first fight feel though when when you got in there it was pretty it's pretty good like I can't quite remember how I felt. I was obviously nervous. I was really nervous for it. Um, but I th- I've always thought training with Jack every day and having him sweep me on the floor for half an hour every day, sparring with him every day, I kind of figured, oh, you'll be all right, you know? And so, yeah, and it was pretty good. I think I won both of those with him, so it ended up being pretty good. It was pretty funny. The second fight I had was actually with the pit, which is quite funny. <laughs> that was pretty cool. So, no, it was all right. And, and you mentioned, you know, um, it was funny that you'd fought someone from, from the pit in your second fight. Yeah. To kind of carry on the story, I guess, recently you've made a move from Riddlers to the pit. Um, what's yes. that kind of transition be like? What what uh, sort of brought that on? Um, well, the transition's been so good. Um, it was kind of real smooth, like they're real Thai style orientated yeah. around training and stuff. So the transition was really easy. All the boys are like top, top boys, you know. Um, not just obviously as fighters, as blokes as well. Yeah. Um, so, no, it's been really easy. Um, I, I could have had a fight, actually. He was actually training for a fight, so I kind of got straight into fight camp. And yeah. then lockdown happened, so I couldn't go where the fight was meant to be. But, yeah, no, it's pretty smooth transitioning over there. And obviously Roy is pretty much like one of the main guys there. He's a trainer now, and he, he's, he's amazing how he like talks about Muay Thai and how he talks about training and stuff like that. You can just tell he's just going to, he's going to take me to that level to what I already am. So that's good. Yeah. We, we uh, actually had Roy on the show to, I don't know, all the days have melted together, but we had Roy on the show. At yeah. Some stage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, and he mentioned that, you know, um, you know, the pit very famous for a hard, you know, tough style of training. Um, Roy mentioned when we spoke with him, he said, you know, sometimes people come to the pit and they just kind of, you know, it's a very, uh, you know, our way or the highway kind of style was how he mm-hmm. described it. And he said that some people 
start to kind of try to – some people start with the pit. It's really not for them. They move away. And, and Roy mentioned even yeah. sometimes these people go on to be – you know, they go elsewhere, they find their fit, and they go on to be okay yeah. fighters. It's just that, um, yeah. you know, the pit's not for everyone. So how have you kind of found that? Is it similar to sort of what you're used to from where you've trained previously or, or was there anything to adjust to? Um, I think – how do I explain? Like the training's definitely hard. But I like that. I don't, um, doesn't really like, doesn't really bother me training hard, getting in there, getting bashed and all that type of stuff doesn't really bother me that much. Um, so yeah. it's pretty easy for me to stretch it, transition over. But obviously all the way through my fight career, I've always had that kind of Thai style way of training. At Rivers, yeah. it was always a little bit different to how the pit are in the sense of, I think Darren's a bit more maybe scientific with how he trains a bit different. Slight, same, same, but different. It's just, how to explain it? I don't know. Like, the pit might be a bit longer training sessions, you know what I mean? So it's a bit, yeah. bit more, as Riddler's might be a bit shorter, but a bit more intense, if that makes yeah. sense. So there's a little bit of difference, but the like the intensities, I've, I don't mind it at all. So. Mm-hmm. so going into your career a little bit more than that, so you've, you've fought on some great promotions from there. You had like one championship. We'll probably delve into a little bit later as well. Yeah. And that, so like, you know, how's were your um, experiences on say like a promotion, like rebellion where you had some absolute cracker fights. Yeah. <laughs> you've seven patch was like probably like, yeah, one of my favorite ones, your ones. Yeah. That was a good one. That was a good one. <laughs> like, um, yeah, it's like, so yeah, talk, talk us through so, like, uh, some of your favorite moments then um, from, uh, f- um, from that era. Um, oh, well, obviously my first fight in Rebellion was against Liam Wright from Superfight. Uh, I can't even remember how long ago that was. Because uh, obviously, obviously everyone that does Muay Thai knows Rebellion. And if you don't, well, I think you kind of need to, I had to learn what it is. Yeah, um, study up. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah study up. <laughs> so, no, that was pretty cool because I think it was me and Lloyd Dean that both fought on the same night. So it was good not being the only one going over and fighting on there. I was both going doing it together. And obviously before I fought on there, I knew what sort of a, a show it was. And I knew if you were on there, you know, you were you were somewhat of a good, good fighter. You know, your side doesn't just have anybody on your shows. So... Yeah. Uh, and obviously, I knew I was fighting a super fight boy. I think before, I think Liam had I'd watched a few of Liam's fights before that. Uh, I know he was really good, so uh, obviously he's trained hard for it and everything like that. And then obviously when I when we fought, was it? I think it was, I think it was a five round fight. I think it was five twos or something like that. I think I can't quite remember, but yeah, no, I ended up winning the fight. I think I kind of controlled it a bit better, used my kicks. Um, Landed a few good sweeps as well. I think yeah, I absolutely. In one in round. particular, one absolutely yeah. wicked sweep in that fight. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that was the first round, and I, I sweeped him. He went, I, he went really high. I seen him go up, and then he kind of landed on his neck, yeah. like on his head, the sideways. So, and I think when he got one. up, his eyes was like real dazed from that. I think so. That was a pretty good one. And then I think in the last round, I think I gave him a cut on his eyebrow yeah. with an elbow, and that was actually the first time I'd ever cut anyone. I was like, elbowed him and we came close and I could taste blood. And I remember going, fuck, am I cut? Because <laughs> I've never been cut. I've had 38 fights and I've never been cut before. So it's like, that's a pretty fun fact. But yeah, I remember tasting the blood and going, shit, I've cut him. Because then obviously when we broke and I saw the big cut, that felt pretty good because obviously it'd be the first time I'd done it. So that was kind of my, my first experience on Rebellion. And obviously after that, my second fight on Rebellion was against Simon Pet. So obviously, obviously everyone, like when I got offered the fight, obviously I knew who Simon Pet was. I'd watched him before. I'd seen him kind of tear it up, you know, when he fought on the eight man. He made it all the way through to the final and fought Singh, who's probably yeah. one of my, probably my favourite in Australia, to be honest. Between him and Kum Saab, I think those two are my favourites. Um, so obviously when I got offered the fight, I was always going to say yes to the fight, no matter what, because it's obviously a massive opportunity. And even if I didn't win, if I fought well, then other doors had opened. So obviously I trained for that fight. And I remember watching before that fight, I watched the fight on one championship when he fought a Southpaw. 
and I saw the southpaw kept landing the jab crossing him. It's like Samapet struggled fighting another southpaw. I don't know what it was or like if mm. he struggles against all southpaws or if it was just on that particular night. But I remember seeing the guy keep landing the jab cross. And obviously when I fought him, that landed a fair few times, the jab cross. So, <clears throat> no, that was pretty good. Um, obviously, like he hit really hard as well. I remember um, at the weigh-in, I saw Alexi there. And Alexi's like, don't worry about his kicks, worry about his hands, because if he hits you, it'll fucking hurt. So obviously, yeah, he hit he hit super fucking hard. I don't think I'd ever been hit like that before. I remember he's like the third round or the fourth round. He hit me. And I remember I forgot what round it was and everything. Like my head was just gone. I was like, damn, what what round is this? Like, oh, round four, I think. I was like, fucking hell. <laughs> because <laughs> I thought it was like round two or something stupid. He said round four. I was like, thanks for <laughs> that was pretty funny, but nah. I think I really controlled that fight. I kind of frustrated him. Towards the end, I think he was just really frustrated trying to take take my head off because I remember in interviews before, I read an interview that he did where he said, oh, I couldn't check, I couldn't block, like all these types of things. I was reading all this stuff and I was like, oh, what the fuck, where did you get that from? And I think almost all of his kicks, I checked them. I think he hardly even hit me with hands. He hit me with a couple. Like, you know, he didn't really do too much. So that, that felt pretty good getting that that on him you know and then those few sweeps I got him in that fight and then I think I I think I messed up his leg pretty good I think if I remember rightly yeah. when he came in and, and throwing the leg kick on there um so now that that obviously that was that's what got what got me signed to one championship obviously winning that fight was you know my mm. big break into into that type of scene so now that that was a really yeah. good fight it was good fun yeah, it was like uh, it was interesting, kind of seeing you know Sam Pesh demeanor, like how it started in the fight. Yeah. And then as the round went on, he could just like you know yeah, he just came yeah. in like you can see he just goes, I'm just gonna fucking knock this boy over. Yeah, you know? yeah. And then after a few rounds and a few kicks, it's like you could just seem to go, oh shit, okay, I'm, I'm gonna actually yeah. actually fight this one. <laughs> yeah. So no, yeah, I think I definitely think he uh, underestimated me a lot because I think before him, I'd fought I'd fought a fair few people, but like I'd never fought anyone. That was like really world class, you know, like him. So he'd probably seen a few fights and gone. Like he might have watched a Liam Wright fight and gone, oh, when I was probably only 17 or something and go, oh, yeah. I'll be all right with that. You know, maybe something like that happened or whatever. But obviously, before I fought Sam Pet, I went on that run where I was, I had like the three knockouts in a row and then I beat all these people. So it was kind of like just join all joining on from that, you know? Yeah. So, as you said before, like you know, that was your springboard into getting signed with one championship. Yeah. Um. So yeah, let's let's dive into that. Uh. So how did how did it come to you? Like you know, um, like you know, in terms of like you know, seeing what their product was about. You know, it's been around just for for not too long. Like finding uh, mm. fighting, fighting in the little gloves for Muay Thai was like those was they were starting to break through. And yeah, you did fight kickboxing as well. But like yeah, talk yeah, about that process of like you know, like the little gloves and Muay Thai. Oh, I think they're absolutely insane. To be honest with you, I don't like it at all. I don't like the little gloves with Moise. I just like, for me, I think it kind of takes away the authenticity of it in the first place, you know, without the music. You can't have liniment on before you fight. You can't get rubbed down with liniment oh. or anything like that. I think that's because of the MMA on the mats. Maybe they don't yeah. want it going to the eyes. Oh, I'm not too sure. Um, I think the little gloves are good if you're hitting someone <laughs> but when you're getting hit with them I don't think it's, it's that, that good but um, like I think the the size of it like before you fight before you walk out and you just hear the roar of the crowd it's insane like I'd obviously never fought in front of anything like that before like the closest thing I can describe to it's being at like a like a concert and the song you like comes on and everyone just goes fucking mad that's the closest thing I can like kind of like relate to it eh? it's pretty it's pretty, yeah. pretty wild it's it's definitely next level like and it kind of like it was like daunting as well like it really got to me i was like fucking hell this isn't just like you know like a local show you're way in you rock up you just like chill out you get your hands wrapped and then when you're ready like you kind of fight like here like you wanted to go to the toilet someone had to take you to the toilet and then and yeah. then walk you back because it was all like time like you had to be do this at this time because it was all obviously live and everything like you know it's pretty pretty full on like you had a police escort to go to the venue and stuff it's pretty it's pretty wild to be honest i was like fucking all this for me 
I mean, like all the few of the other boys are like, fuck it. <laughs> so now it's pretty different. And uh, obviously my first fight on there, I, I fought Yod Pan and Rong, Jit Mung Non. And obviously it's pretty funny when I was, first time I went to Thailand, I got a photo with him when he fought at Lumpia yeah. and I was like 16 or something like that. And I was like, Jesus Christ. Yeah, that was pretty cool. But obviously I'll never turn down fights like that. So, yeah. And yet... And you, you mentioned kind of fighting. It's kind of like your your springboard performance was against Samer Petch, who was he was yeah. signed to one before you fought him. He had a few yeah. fights in one, as you say. Yeah. And um, then you know that kind of is your foot in the door, kind of puts your name on on the map a little bit. And and what's it yeah. like to? Because we see this a lot, and I think this is how one championship for Australian fighters differs a lot for the trajectory. For example, uh, a major boxer who signs with uh, a high end promotion yeah. in the US, signs with top rank or something, they don't jump straight in and, and go and fight Terence yeah. Crawford, right? They get yeah. their little build-ups. And it's the same when our MMA fighters go to the UFC. They start on the, the bottom end of the card or they start on yeah. a local a local UFC and yeah. fight kind of like someone who's also starting out. But that's not the case for Australian no. Muay Thai fighters starting mm. one, right? So what's it like to get the call and say, okay, first cab off the rank, you're Panam Rock? Oh, well... I'll let you in on a little secret. Before I signed to one, I actually got offered a fight in Japan against Tawan Chai. So there was like, I had those two to like, obviously, I heard about the Tawan Chai fight first. And I was like, shit, I was like, all right, I'll fucking do it, whatever. And then obviously I signed to one because it was a six fight contract, one championship. So I ended up choosing that one instead. But I got offered that Tawan Chai fight beforehand. I think one of the boys at the gym had a friend in Japan that was a promoter. And he watched a fight with Simon Pet or something like that. Yeah. And they asked if I'd fight Tao and China. I was like, yeah, right. But obviously, I signed with one instead. But obviously, I knew who it was. And yeah, I, I, I'm kind of just like that. With like, I love fighting ties. I'd rather fight ties than, than fighting Westerners. I think it suits my style a bit better. I think yeah, you I get more that. out of me when I fight someone. When I fight someone of that same, cut, like, that level. It just brings me up a bit more, I guess. But, um, yeah, it was so surreal getting like getting the contract and going, this is your first fight against Yod Pan and Rong. I was like, Jesus. I thought maybe they'll give us a little warm-up fight first or something like that. But, no, nah, I got thrown straight in, which I don't, I don't mind getting thrown straight into it. Like, I'm all for it. Um, obviously, I did beat Sam previously. And when we got there, that's why they did say that they gave us Yod Pan and Rong was because I beat Summer Pet in kind of the fashion that I did, I guess. So I guess they were kind of justified in giving me that fight straight away. Um, so obviously fighting him was a bit of a different story. He fucking battered me, to be fair. Like, I think I started off okay. Um, I think I caught him with, a uh, like, a left hand quite early in the first, which kind of wobbled him a little bit, I think. Yeah. Um, and I started okay, getting a few kicks off, blah, blah, blah. And at the end of the, uh, the first round, I think I heard his corner screaming at him. I'd like, they must have thought I won the round or something. And I remember hearing him like screaming at him. And he just came out like a machine. Those knees are just something else. I've never been kneed like that in my life, eh? Never. It was, it was, it was pretty insane. And then it was kind of like brought down to the reality where I was and then where I needed, what I needed to do to then go to the next level of where they are, kind of thing, you know? Yeah, I mean, not many knee like a Pan and Rong, right? It's no. Pre- pretty well known for it in a place yeah. where people can knee pretty well. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, he, but that, I guess in that moment, I guess I kind of needed that type of loss. I think it had been a long time since I had a loss anyway. Um, it'd been a long time. I, it, I haven't lost in Australia for a good, I think, four or five years, maybe, or something like that anyway. So it's been a while since I've lost here anyway. But I think that kind, I needed that. Because obviously I struggled with the wake up for a start. I don't like using those types of things as an excuse, like the hydration tests and things. I failed. I failed their hydration tests, and I had to weigh in on the day of, of my fight, where he got to refuel 24 hours before, fighting about a kilo or so lighter than normal. So it was like 65 and a half or something. Yeah, I'm a 67 kilo fighter, and I, I have to cut to get there. You know, I don't you know, breeze to get there or whatever I do have to cut. So it's a pretty stressful thing trying to get to that weight. Never done a hydration test before. Like didn't really know 
what I was doing, you know, and, you know, failed that. And then having to, having such a little time to be able to replenish again, to be able to fight when usually I'd walk, like go into the ring at 74, 75 kilos. I was going in there at about 69 or something like that. So mm. it's like, it's pretty, it's a pretty big, big difference, you know, but I don't like using that as an excuse. I lost the fight, but obviously it did play a factor in it. Yeah, and it is like quite a, a starkly different way to go through a fight week. Like for one, like yeah. you, you switch from fighting locally to fighting. Mm. Um, where, where was the fight with your opponent? Was that? Um, it was it was Jakarta in Indonesia. Jakarta, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you know you've already got to fly in, and then you mm. don't just have to land and make weight. You've got to. I, I mean, did you mm. come into that? I suppose was there a plan to kind of do things really distinctly differently for the hydration test, or did you just kind of cut weight as normal and say what no, was going to happen? We, because George, because George had already fought on one championship before that, and he'd obviously already done the the hydration test and stuff. And he's so a he, big lad when, too. He's ma- like he is yeah. a unit man. I do. <laughs> I still to this day. He, he, because obviously he's one of my best mates. We talk all the time. He goes, I can still make 70. I was like, mate, you talk shit. <laughs> you ain't making 70 kilos. I was like, there's no chance. Because I was I was, I was in for that eight man at 70 in Melbourne on, when, what was it? On the kickboxing one, the eight man they yeah. were doing. Yeah, Alpha. I was in that. And he's, yeah, that's the one. And he was giving me shit like, oh, I should have done that. I can make 70 and all this. It was pretty funny. I was like, there's no way you're making that, mate. But obviously he, he fought Smoking Joe. He'd done the, the hydration test and everything. And even him coming back, he said, mate, it was like the hardest thing. Like he just passed his, his P test by like just. So he was lucky that he even passed them. So I went, we went there aiming to do the exact same thing as he did. And obviously, I don't, obviously me, I just, luck of the draw, I didn't pass the hydration test. I just like, obviously I could pee, but it was, I was too dehydrated. Mm. So, yeah, um, big, big, big difference. Yeah. Did you switch things up much between the first time and this? Like, when you went um, back to one the second time yeah. and for yeah. um, Chen Lin Zhang, did, were you doing yeah. it quite differently? Like, had you refined the process yeah. a bit? Yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's funny. With, I was like, yeah, all right. Because obviously when you when I failed the first one, we're like, right, just drink until your pee's clear. And then, obviously, you know you're hydrated. So then the next day I'd wake up, my pee was all right. So then I'd drink again and hold my pee and then cut the weight. It sounds like a, such a weird way of like doing it. Like it, it makes zero sense. Like to me in my head, it makes no sense. I'm holding my pee and then trying to sauna. It's like, what the fuck am I doing this for? But that's so the second time I went, we went with the, the idea of drinking six, seven liters every day, trying to be as hydrated as we can all week. And then on the weigh-in day, drinking in the morning cutting the weight and then you should be okay you know that was like the logic that we we had in our head so i was hydrated all week drinking six seven liters a day trying to like keep keep it up and then on weighing day lose the weight and i lost the weight i did like i had a bit more weight than probably what i should have had to lose but i think that was just purely because of all the water i was trying to drink to pass the hydration test yeah and uh, I still didn't. I still didn't pass. I, I failed it on the second time as well. But the second time on the first weigh-in, it was a lot closer than the original. But I still missed it by like my twenty of their numbers on how they read it or whatever. So it was still a little way off. And then obviously I had to go through the process again of, of weighing in on the day again. So I had to do the exact same thing that I did the first fight and the second fight. And just for the sake of anyone listening who, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tyler, um, if yeah. you, people are a little bit less familiar with the one championship process, uh, you know, if you're listening, you're probably aware that one don't just check guys' weight, they test them for hydration in an effort to curb excessive weight cutting. And what Tyler's touching on there is if you make weight the day before uh, in the, the pre-fight weigh-in, but you fail hydration, you have to make weight again on the day of the fight, um, you know, to make yeah. sure that you haven't kind of re- rehydrated too much. So that's yeah. basically and then, it. And then, then you have to pi- pass hydration test again. So you have, so yeah. originally you have two, so you fight on the Friday, you're weighing on the Wednesday, you have to do the weight check and hydration. Then you have to do it again on the Thursday. 
weight check and hydration. But if you fail one of them, you have to do it again on fight day, weight check and hydration. And the Wednesday, like the first weigh-in and the second weigh-in, do you have to make the fight weight or do you have to be with yeah. X amount? So you make your actual fight you weight. Have, you have to actually be on weight, yeah. yeah, yeah. You key. have to actually be on weight for both of them. So, yeah, it's, it's really – it's all right if you're not cutting weight or trying to lose weight, but I'm fighting 65 and a half when I'm a 67-kilo fighter. Yeah. That walks around at 74, 75. So it was quite – quite difficult but i was the one that signed on the dotted line to do it no one forced me to do it but you know it was just a learning curve at the time and you have been in the last couple of fights um you know you, you've been uh floating around a little bit more now like like uh, taking yeah. some fights up at 70 uh yeah. when the time comes to go back to one do you think you'll go a little bit heavier i don't know at the moment my one contract's up i don't have one it ended it was a two-year contract that I had a six fights. And, well, it was a two-year time span. They said yeah. you could have six fights within that time. You could have two, four, whatever. So with them anymore, that's up. And if I'm honest, I don't know if it's the route I'd like to go down again, just because, okay. it's like, it was a good experience. But for me as a fighter, I'm not sure if it's how... I want to go down, you know, without the music, without liniment. It's just, I'm quite like that. I love the all. I don't just do Muay Thai just to fight. I love every part about it, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, just, yeah. So if I got offered, I'd think about it, but I'm not sure if it's something I'd, I'd want to do again. Hmm. If you haven't seen Tyler fight before, he has Muay Thai's life tattooed across his chest. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> he's serious. <laughs> I have. <laughs> yeah. So, so, like, it's interesting that you mentioned that, that maybe, because it, it does feel like most pro fighters want to go the one championship mm. way. Um, yeah, and, yeah. you know, I, I have heard that sentiment that people that have done it and they say, look, it was good, but, uh, you know, you can keep it now. I've done it. Yeah, yeah. Um, for, for yourself, as far as, like, what you consider to be, like, the pinnacle, what you're really aspiring mm. towards, like, where is your focus sitting more so now? To be honest with you, I just want to fight the best. To be honest, yeah. it's not about, I don't like, I've already fought on one championship. I've done that. I just like want to fight all the big names, just do the best I can, just rise the ranks, you know, maybe get a title here and there as you go along. Yeah. But yeah, obviously tra travel around, obviously when we can, if we can travel around the world and fight. Obviously I want to go back to England and fight because that's obviously where I'm from. Then all my family yeah. can come and watch, but. Yeah, I kind of just want to rise like the WBC ranks a bit more and yep. you know, just things like that. Go like more how just do what everyone else would before one. Just go down that that route, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah. look, you mentioned there was, um, you know, some tentative talk about a fight with Tamon Chai. Um, yeah. He's, he's, uh, he's red hot at the moment. There was also, yeah. be before the world went nuts, um, there was going to be a massive card here in Sydney that you were going to headline um, opposite mm. a man who you previously yeah. mentioned as one of your favourites, Simpai. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. you know, these are big names that you're kind of getting talk talked about jumping in yeah. here with. Who else is, I mean, uh, uh, as things start to, yeah. you know, hopefully approach being normal again, uh, mm. kind of who's, Who's on your sort of list of dream fights? Is there anyone that really stands out that, that you'd love to get in there with? For me personally, at the moment, like you see, like the in Australia at the moment, the number one person uh, who I see is at the top is obviously Singh Payak. He's yeah. obviously a fight that I still want, but I'd also love to get in there with Chad Collins. I'd love to give that a good crack. He's obviously yeah. back in Australia now. I'm not too sure what the the goal is with him with weight. Because he's, he's yeah. matched at sixty three and a half with Duck. Would he come to sixty seven? I'm not too sure if he, if he's staying at sixty three now or he's going back up. But maybe if we both get dried up for fights, it'd be something he'd maybe consider or whatever. That'd but be sick. That'd be a really good fight. Um, I think Alexi's coming back. Uh, obviously, love to get in there with him. Yep. He, he's always been someone that I've watched for years as well. He obviously fought everybody. Um, all the top names, man. Like I'm not, I'm like not really too bothered, to be fair. You know, I'll, I'll fight anyone at the end of the day. But all, obviously, I want to, don't just want to get given the opportunities without earning it as well. You know. Definitely. Yeah, for sure.
Yeah. It's like like locally for yourself, is there a few names like in Perth? I say say if you know we're in this period of Corona. <laughs> like yeah, there's, yeah. Not, there's not many people getting flown in in, in, in a state like that. No, nah, there's not. Yeah, it limit you a little bit. Mm. Um, I could fight Damon Nelson again for the third time if he was up to that. He did just win the Aussie title. Um, he did too. Yeah. About a month ago or something like that. Uh, there'd be him. Maybe Jordan Godfredson. Maybe he's he's a he's a beast. I think he's criminally underrated in Muay Thai. I don't think you hear enough about him. I think he's you know he's fought some of Het Singh Pak. He's fought so many people. I think he's I think he's not talked about enough in the terms he's of class. the best in Australia. I don't think I think he's in in really really good. So that would be someone I'd love to definitely get into the ring with. Obviously, again, would he come up to sixty seven or maybe I'd have to go down an extra kilo to sixty six or something to maybe make it happen or something like that but he's definitely someone i'd love to share the ring with as well oh, yeah but you can boys can find some middle ground you know just make the fight yeah up. that's it the yeah fight. yeah i went up to 70 not long ago and that's pretty that's three kilos of my fight right yeah <laughs> that was an interesting one as well because right? lucas is quite a big lad like he prefers yeah. middle he prefers middleweight to the best of my yeah. knowledge um, yeah. I was interested to see that kind of come across, mm. you know, my feed. Like, oh, what's what weight? You know, it didn't quite yeah. make sense to see. It was cool though. I, I like yeah. it when guys don't fuss too much about the weight. You know, I'll, I'll come a little yeah. bit down. You, you know, you met in the middle because you wanted to fight, right? Yeah, that's it. So obviously, I got offered the fight, and I like Lucas. He's a good, good lad. Like even yeah. before I fought, we used to talk and all that type of stuff. And he's a top lad. And obviously, Carl, I know Carl quite well. When I used to be with Jack 300, he actually used to train there as well. So I've known him for a long, long time. Who's like uh, Lucas's main train in the carpool yeah. here. And then Frankie used to be a pad holder at Riddler's years ago anyway, before he opened Diesel. So we're all quite familiar with each other anyway. So I've got nothing but respect for those boys. So I was always happy to take the fight. And his style is very similar to mine. So it was always going to be a good fight. It was a nice fight to watch. It was, it was a good yeah, fight. Yeah, it was. It was. I really enjoyed it, actually. It was a good, like, bit technical fight. You know, it was good. Yeah, and how did you feel up at that way? Um, it would have been your, your first fight up at 70. Yeah. In, in a was. while, at the very least. Your first at all, maybe? It was my first. I'd never yeah. fought at 70 before. Uh, I don't think I'd ever been offered it either. So I was just like, yeah, go on. Easy weight cut. If, you know, easy. Get the weight easy. And then... When I got into the fight on the outside, I was all right. But when we got in the clinch once or twice, I felt I definitely felt the difference. He'd put on a lot more weight than me. I don't know what yeah. he'd put on, but he was definitely heavier in the clinch. So there was that aspect of it. But obviously, as you said, he fights at 72 and a half normally anyway. So he lost an extra two and a half kilos to make that weight. So mm -hmm. he, he might have gone in there at 78 kilos heavier. I don't know. So it was a big, big difference. But it, either way, it was a good fight. Yeah, it was a great fight. So, like, you know, going up in the weight and things like that. Um, so, do you have someone that manages, like, say, your nutrition or your, your strength and conditioning as well? And have you uh, made changes in the last few years? Yes, I have. So, I think it was kind of what kind of prompted me to go down the nutrition route and then for my strength and conditioning. Because, like, I've never liked lifting weights. I'm like, I train Muay Thai. I don't go to the gym to lift fucking weights. I'm not, I don't, like, I don't like now I'm into it I like doing what I do but before I was like oh, fuck that why do I want to do that for I want to get strong at the clinch then I'll clinch like I don't need yeah. to lift weights to get stronger at that but I always had that type of mentality before where you know oh fuck that I don't want to do that I'll just clinch like everyone else or whatever so obviously it's kind of the one championship thing kind of turned me because everyone there would have had a nutritionist everyone had a strength coach everyone like had this would have had this big team around them. Like, even you look at Liam Harrison, like, he does strength, and then he'll do Muay Thai at Bad Company, and then you see videos, and he's doing boxing somewhere else. So he's, like, bettered himself by going down three or four different routes at different places mm. and doing different things, you know? So I kind of took inspiration from that a little bit and started uh, doing my strength and nutrition nutrition at a, the gym's called uh mandy hopper performance mandy hopper is actually a fighter out of riddlers she actually fights next week on mtgp she owns the gym that i um that i go through to do my strength and nutrition personally my trainer is lewis um so smart honestly i think the the first fight i had under him was when i fought in queensland against that tie earlier in the year 
And I think it's the easiest weight cut I've ever had at 67. I, I, th- I yeah. don't think I've had an easier weight cut. Um, going into fight week, I was about a kilo and a half lighter than I normally would be. And that's without even eating less food. I was eating more food than what I'd ever been eating before. Then obviously doing strength three times a week as well. It's been, a, it's been like a game changer, you know. So it's been, it's been really, really good. So you mentioned kind of like the nutrition side of things and the, um, yeah. you know, the effect it had kind of letting you sort of cruise into weight a little bit. What about yeah. sort of, like you mentioned, you're the same as me. Like I had to be convinced to start doing any strength conditioning because yeah. I thought it was boring, but um, yeah. I, I like it now. I same as you, I like it now. But I yeah, mean, I, I like I was... it now. Like, now. Now I get into it. I'm like, all right, cool. And then there's a little group session on a Saturday and I'm like, oh, I'll go down and do that. Like, So no, I'm, I'm definitely yeah. into it now. So, yeah, what about kind of like when you're on the pads now and in the ring, like how, how do you kind of feel mm. body-wise? Um, you know, you, you feel like you can feel the difference on on those Muay Thai kind of outcomes, like power and clinch strength and stuff like that. Like you can really feel the transferability. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Pardon me. The power, like even when I'm hitting pads, is so different. I felt it almost straight away because all the, the programming that he does, each movement's aimed – for Muay Thai it's not just him throwing a whole bunch of things together and going do that because it works this muscle this muscle this muscle every movement I do is aimed for like like you know he'll get me to I don't even know how to, I don't even know what the bloody call but he'll do things for punching like me throwing a ball against the wall to get yeah. that kind of power he'll do explosive movements where I'm jumping off the floor with weight to like you know that kind of replicates a kick kind of thing you know when you're yeah. driving your force upwards so everything is tailored for fighting it's not just a whole bunch of shit put together do this so you look better it's all aimed for for fighting yeah and do you think that can kind of for fighters i guess be the misconception when it comes to strength conditioning is like they're like i don't want to lift weights because it's not relevant to mm. muay thai and yeah. then you actually start to get into it with someone who knows what they're doing and you can yeah. kind of feel like oh no this this makes some sense hundred percent. I definitely recommend everyone to do it really. Like it's good to have like for me as well, what I found is good to have something else outside of Muay Thai as well. I go to a different gym. There's different people there. It's, it's something that I have no idea about. So I'm obviously learning every day. So it keeps my brain active and always yeah. learning into doing different stuff. So I definitely recommend it for everyone to be honest, especially the nutrition side. I think that's one of the biggest game changers for me. Just, just being able to eat so much food and my weight stay like just drop. It's just insane. It, it like makes no sense when you think about it like that. Yeah. <laughs> how was your eating? Or how did your eating look beforehand then? Oh, but like years ago, I did go and see a nutritionist a long, long time ago, and he gave me this, this, um, this plan. And I think I did it for about two days. I was like, "Now nah, this is fucking boring. I just, I just kind of made it up as I went along kind of thing. Like when I had fights and stuff, obviously leading into the fight week, Darren would obviously eat this, eat that, do this, do that kind of thing. And I'd always like, all right, cool. I'd do that. But leaning up, I'd always just like kind of just make it up or whatever. So it probably when I told Lewis what I was eating before, he was just like, you're an idiot. <laughs> He's like, you need me, bro. <laughs> He was like, I don't know how you're training at the level you are or have been for so long and you're like, oh, fucked yet. I was like, uh, I don't know. I think I'm probably just used to it. But, yeah, it wasn't that good. <laughs> was it kind of a matter of, like, underfeeding? Did, did he think when, when you got to look at your food? Yeah. Or? So it wasn't that I was eating, eating shit food or anything like that. I was still eating healthily, but there just wasn't enough. Yeah. There just wasn't enough there like it. You know, obviously, as fighters, you all know when, you know, sometimes you're going into a fight and your weight's a little heavier than normal. Your natural instinct is to eat less. Yeah. Eat less and train more and your weight will go down. That was like always my mentality where you'd eat a bit less or, well, a lot less. And then, you know, when, in matter of fact, what Lewis is doing, he's got no eat more. And I don't know how it's, and then my weight's just coming down just the same. I don't understand the science behind it. He just, I just do what he tells me to do. (laughs) I've got no idea what he does. I'm just like, all right, no problem. More food, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> You've convinced me. That's it. Yeah, legit. <laughs> That's it. He's not a nutritionist. He's a shaman. This is fucking black. <laughs> <is>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
so um oh. also as well like it must run in your family you have a brother that, that, I do. that it has um how's that dynamic <laughs> no, Between... it, it's it's pretty good eh? like we're, we're we're pretty close like we're two totally different people like if you ever met us and talked to us you'd be like or even looked at us you go you two are fucking brothers like you look nothing alike like he's got dark hair i've got lighter hair we just look nothing alike but He's he's only just coming through the the state ranks now. He um he he fought for the state title. Uh, when was it? Like two weeks ago. WBC two weeks ago, yeah. and, and and fractured his rib. Um, he started off quite well, but I, I guess those things kind of happen. Johnny won on the night. Fair play, but um, there there probably should have been probably will be a rematch. To be fair, but no, the dynamics pretty good. We we help it, and obviously he's at the pit. So obviously we're back training together now. Um, so obviously that that that's that's really good. Um, so he he's just he's just slowly getting his groove into in it, finding his own yeah. style and and all that type of thing. So he's I think he's had just over ten fights. I think he I think fourteen maybe or something like that. So he's still kind of fresh to it. Yeah, that was my question as well about yourself and, and Brandon. I, I fought on the mm. same show as what would have been one of his first fights. And I remember I yeah. um because I, I, I figured you were, you know, Simon mentioned that, you know, yeah. he was Tyler's brother. And I was like, oh, Tyler's got a brother who fights <laughs> as well. But then, yeah. like, I remember the first thing thinking about you, they're not at the same gym. So, like, uh, I guess, um, no. was that something you guys did on purpose? Like, you didn't want to train together, you wanted to train different places, or was it just not really like that? No, it wasn't like that. He started at Riddler's and then obviously after a while wasn't there anymore. Um, and then, yeah, he, he – where did he go after that? I think he was at Legends, Legends or, after that for a little yeah. bit. Yeah, he was after, there for a little bit. He was there for a little while and then things didn't work out and then he ended up going to the pit. And the way Brandon is, he fits in at the pit so well. It's like a perfect mold for him, who he is as a person. And like how he interacts and stuff, he's just like, and I like even I told him years ago, go to the pit. You go there, you will suit that place. Like you'll just get along with everybody. So he fit in there really, really well. So he's 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 grand down there. He he loves it. And then what's it kind of like to after spending, you know, the, he's developing his career. You're, of course, kind of yeah. climbing the ranks and then now coming back together, you can sort of train yeah. together. What's that sort of been like? It's been really good, actually. Like, even even before we were back training together, he'd always ask me stuff and I'd always help him out and, and stuff like that. So, but now we're together, we can actually get hands on with clinching and sparring and, and stuff like that. So that's pretty good. Obviously, that always gets a bit competitive. He's like, oh, I'll back you. Imagine. And I'm like, all right, come on then, little boy. <laughs> see what you got. But no, no. I just lagged there for a second. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sweet. Uh, so, um, then, mate, so we're kind of approaching about the end of our time here. Matt, yep. if my... Shit, stop lagging. Jesus Christ. Yeah, we're approaching <laughs> the time. It's always about that. Neck gives up, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> always on the hour but yeah. like uh, so like you, you like as you as like an experienced fighter that's like you know mate for like really top level from there um what's some words of advice you give some of these younger fellas coming up now and there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of great young talent coming up from there like what's a couple of things that you can point out to them to kind of think to give them the best like you know success in their careers um i think always just training hard and 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 taking inspiration from a lot of different fighters. Like you see a lot of people sometimes might take inspiration from just one fighter and try and do everything that they do. Um, try pick a handful of ties or whoever and try just learn as much as you can. Um, train as hard as you can and then have that balance between training and then like having things outside of training as well. So I think I went through a period when I was younger, all I did was train, train, train. And I had nothing outside of Muay Thai. And, you know, you, you get to a point where you fall out of love with it, you know. So I think having that balance is really, really important from training and then having things outside of it as well. Absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah. Mm. I think that, that seems to be like a recurring theme to a, a few of these. Like, you know, yourself, Roy, was a big part of uh, said that as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so true. Yeah. It's it. So much. Yeah. So you got to balance it. It's massive. 
Yeah, a hundred percent. You definitely, you definitely need something outside of Muay Thai, no matter what it is. You definitely need a little, like a little social circle or something like that, just somewhere where you can go when Muay Thai is not even the conversation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> right, definitely. Nah. Cool, mate. So, look, mate. Look, appreciate it. this. Was an awesome chat. There. Thank you. Appreciate um, it. So, where can people find you? Like, you know, best way to reach out to if they want to have a speak or anything like that. All whatever is all your next stuff coming up. Yeah, uh, so my Instagram is Tyler Hardcastle 96, I think, or just Tyler underscore Hardcastle or something like that. I don't even know, to be fair, but if you <laughs> type in Tyler Hardcastle, it's an open page, you'll find it. <laughs> but that, that's probably the best place to find me. <laughs> Great. Oh, oh, he's gone. Gone. <laughs> <laughs> hey, later, mate. Okay. All right, it's cool. So um, he might come back on. We'll- but like you know, from here, so uh, there he is. We're saying yeah, proper, proper goodbye. <laughs> you know, I keep swiping. I swipe the thing left. I'm on my phone, so I swipe the screen and it takes it off. It's, it, mate. it's, not, it's not Tinder. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's like I'm done here. It yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. It's like the full drop the mic moment. Nah, I'm there. You oh, playing screen? Shit. Bye. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're not even going to edit that part out, are you? <laughs> no. <laughs> that in. That's great. Leave right. it in there. Yeah. So um, <laughs> just hang, just keep hanging on there, Tyler. We'll talk to you a little bit after the intro. Yeah, no worries. Uh, Easy. Outro. Easy. Sounds good, bro. Uh, so everyone else, though, yep, like, subscribe, share the fucking episode, okay, from there. Um, <laughs> once again, thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. See ya. Peace. See ya.